get started. Uh, my name is Curtis Mont. I'm the director of this space here, the World Languages and Digital Humanities Studio. I see some, some new faces, so I just wanted to provide an, an overview up front real quick of some of the things that uh, we're up to over here at the studio. First and foremost, we run this event, the DH Meetup. It meets bi-monthly, um, and we kind of range from like panel discussions and lectures, engaging with pressing topics uh, from the digital landscape, from a perspective of the humanities, and particularly global humanities. Um, that's kind of what we do on, on one end, and on the other end, we're talking about digital pedagogy, running workshops. Um, bringing digital tools into the classroom, so on and so forth. So today's kind of a nice, I think, cross-section of those two things as we're talking about AI um, and its impact on the university, but we're also going to give you some, you know, uh, detailed looks at lesson plans, case studies of what we've actually been doing in the classroom. We're doing that with an interdisciplinary uh, panel I'm really excited about. We'll get to the panel and what we're doing a little bit later. I just want to cover the other things that we're doing here at the studio on a regular basis. One of those is the VR Classroom for World Cultures, uh, and that is run by Michael Hall, uh, our PhD candidate in uh, Complet um, and Comparative Studies, um, and Cultural Studies, and uh, Isidoro Villa, uh, who's probably, I think, stopping by later, mm -hmm. but uh, they make VR learning accessible to WLLC faculty and graduate students, right? So it seems daunting, but how am I going to get a VR language learning unit into my classroom. That's a lot. Uh, headsets on students. How's it like? How does it work? What game should I use? Should I use a game? Should I use a video? Right. So Mike and Izzy facilitate that process. They provide uh, guidance and they lesson plan right alongside our teachers, uh, and they help implement the lessons here at the studio. Uh, we're also involved in student success. We run peer learning workshops and <clears throat> a whole award. Uh, and grant uh, a structure uh, for WLC faculty, uh, undergrads, and grads. Um, and we're also engaged in curricular development. I'm teaching courses in uh, DH, so I teach uh, intro to DH, which I'll be looking at uh, later today more closely, but also um, DH special topics, topics, which kind of changes from year to year. Last spring, we talked about humanities in the metaverse, and this spring, we're talking about video games and human agency. Um, but those courses and the courses taught by uh, classics professor and game design professor David Frederick, also in the WLC department, um, those combine to uh, serve as the core of some programs we're in the process of developing. One is a minor in world cultures, game design, and digital humanities. That's for undergraduates. And the other is a micro certificate for graduate students. Uh, for us, it's really important that game design and DH mingle with one another. I think DH has a lot to show game design and vice versa. Um, so that's kind of the, the heart of both of those pieces of curriculum. I'm talking about all our DH oriented stuff, but this is um, this space here is actually really, we're really excited to be hosting all of the diverse world cultural and world language events uh, hosted by or run by WLOC. Language tables, uh, movie nights, uh, language tutoring services. These are all things that happen here on a daily basis. Later today, we'll have the French table. When does that start? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. French table, two o'clock. I think we have Stammtisch then, the German table at three. And then five o'clock, we have Portuguese table. That's just a typical day here at the WLDH studio. So there's a lot to, to keep uh, track of, to follow along. So please uh, use the QR code there. It'll take you to our website. You can follow us on socials. Um, and please add us to your Outlook calendar if you want to know what's happening here on a day-to-day -day basis. So today, we are talking about AI in the classroom. And um, the, before we get to our, to our panel, I just want to say this is the third of a three-part series. So uh, about a month ago, or a month and a half ago now, we had our first panel, which was AI in society. We had Lu Zeng from CompSci, professor from CompSci. We had JLA Donahue, a professor from the Department of Philosophy. And Nadia Issa, a professor from the School of Art, all join us to talk about to have an interdisciplinary discussion about how AI is impacting society. Um, that uh, session, along with the following session, which was on AI and storytelling, um, those, are, those have both been recorded, and they're on our website. So if you go to our website, you can find recordings uh, of those sessions. This session today is being recorded. I forgot to cue you to start recording. I hope you started recording. Okay. No, I didn't. I've <laughs> just been wasting our time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this, this event is being recorded, it will be posted on our website along with, with the earlier sessions. 
AI and storytelling was a lot of fun. We had local game developers um, from a game studio called Unlimited, uh, and Joe Payne and Stephanie Essen. They came in and talked about how they're building their own uh, uh, large language model uh, for creating role-playing games. Um, augmented reality kind of procedural um, role-playing games. Um, and we also had Greg Rogers, who's at University of Arkansas. Alumni, uh, he showed up, he's the creative director at another local game studio called Causeway. Um, so they all talked about how a AI impacts their day-to-day -day schedules, but also like what they're you know, hoping for and also worried about. Uh, when it comes to AI impacting the game industry for big developers, but also for small to mid-sized developers like Causeway and Unlimited. Um, and I'll mention Unlimited later uh, again. Um, but yeah, those are the first two. This is our third, the format of today, uh, today's um, workshop slash panel um, is we're going to have 10 minute presentations from each of our panelists. And then after each 10 minute presentation, we'll have five minutes for Q&A. I'll be doing my best to moderate, but you know I'll need to cues from folks in the audience too if we're, if we're going long. Please help me out. I, you know, it's so much. It's like exciting stuff we're going to be talking about, so we can get kind of caught up in it and lose track of time. We want to stay stick to this 10-minute presentation, five-minute Q&A as much as possible. Um, but our order will be Ken Busa going first from Global Studies, and then uh, we'll hear from Maggie Fernandez in our English department, and then our PhD candidate in uh, conflict and uh, cultural studies, Guillermo Pupo Pernet, who's also a TA for Spanish, and then I'll close out coming from the perspective of digital humanities and world cultures. So uh, with that, let's get to our first panelist, Ken Music. Everyone, let's uh, welcome Ken Music. Hello, everyone. I'm from Global Campus. So we deal primarily with the online offerings for the university. You know, we do four credit uh, degree plans. We have. Spanish major and minor online, and we're hoping to bring others. We have English coming online as well. Um, so early on, I guess, uh, last November, right, was when uh, this was released, ChatGPT 3, I think it was 3 at that point. Uh, we realized early on that there was no going back, and so we, from then on, we started playing with it, researching it, reading about it, and looking for pedagogical uses integrated into the classroom for uh, a variety of uses, both for the instructor and for the students. Um, so after, uh, also over the summer, Auburn released a course in AI that kind of takes you from zero to probably five. It uh, is mainly for instructors and how to incorporate it into your course. The TFSC and Global sponsored some seats for that. And in addition to that, and some readings that our team did, and some research, we've kind of distilled down a couple of things in that for, in, just speaking for instructors now, you'll want to develop your own AI policy statement for your syllabus. And there's a couple of reasons why. You know your students are already using it. Um, you want to put some boundaries on that. You want to help them know I mean, academic integrity is on everybody's mind as soon as it came out. And they did have some detectors early on. OpenAI had their own detector. Uh, we were playing with that, and then uh, quickly it got pulled because it wasn't good enough. It's just not able to 100% reliably detect AI-created content. Like SafeAssign uh, can do and uh, turn it in for grad classes. Plagiarism is a lot easier to see. You have a set number of words in a row. This isn't that anymore. Um, so you want to put some boundaries on it, tell them where they can use it, how they can use it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll abide by your policy, but at least you have told them how you feel about it, connected it to academic integrity, and uh, put your own kind of boundaries on it. Something else, the, another theme that has arisen is equity of access. So we want to make sure that your students who may not have access to this for a variety of reasons. Right now, ChatGPT 3.5 is free, but 4 is a pay for. So we want to be very aware that um, your students have equal access to this because it's quickly becoming a pay for model. And unfortunately, like other things, your wealthier students will have an advantage. And so we want
want to be able to address that. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is integrating AI into your course. And the reason for that is it's going to be in everybody's lives from here on into the future. It's going to be in their careers. It's going to be in their home life. I don't know if you've already noticed, but Word, uh, in Microsoft Word, the predictor has become much better over the last year, <coughs> predicting what you're going to type next. Same in Outlook, same in other things. So look for ways to incorporate it into your class. Review your assignments. If your assignments are down to just rote memorization, you know, assignments like that kind of went out when Good Search Engine and Wikipedia came along. And you had to up your game then and make your assignments more, more analytical, more thought-provoking, more human interaction in, in those. So review your assignments. And do they require human creativity, interpretation, judgment, analysis, and work those in? And you can do that with AI. So we, uh, I have a handout here. We'll make these available digitally later as well. So there are some ideas that we've created. Um, you can do a timeline using AI, thinking about uh, history courses or any of the 1,000, 2,000 level basic courses where you're doing a review of the history of, of any topic. You can do that. Um, something that I like through literature is, and people have been using AI to do this already. I've read about projects at other universities where they dump an author's work into an AI and use it to find the themes in that work. So you can either do that for, um, I read, they did this with Agatha Christie. Uh, they dumped all of her novels in, and they started noticing where her word usage, the number of words that she was using were, was dropping off, and that is where they suspected that her illness, uh, she may have had a series of, of small strokes taken away some of her vocabulary. But you can also look at political themes through that, through multiple authors. And uh, you know, in, in science fiction, it has always been the tradition to use uh, a science fiction world to reflect the political upheaval of the time in any society. And so you can use AI to help you do that. There's also um, using prompts. So you can ask it simple questions. But developing more complex prompts will help you get the answer you're looking for. And this is a skill that you want your students to develop as well. You know, when the answers are there, they just need to know how to ask the question. So there are certain prompts, and I have some examples here. Um, the outline expansion prompt is one that I use a lot. I'm one of those writers when I'm do, preparing for a presentation or writing a paper, I stare at a blank page and I don't know where to go. I might be able to get an introduction, I'll do the top level you know, bullet point. But the outline expander, you can use it to generate, um, so I was looking at a project recently for a, a communication policy, to develop a communication policy for a university. I didn't really know where to start, not my expertise. So I used the expansion, the outline expansion, and it generated about eight good bullet points. Then I said, okay, expand the second one, expand that, expand that, and before you know it, you'll have a complete outline of everything you need to cover, and then you can start writing. I'm sure a lot of you have used it as an editor to review your written work and either um, simplify, condense, that is great. I wish it was available when I was working on my dissertation. <laughs> um, you can also have your students use it as a, as a tutor. So you can set up a prompt where it asks them questions on a particular topic. I'm thinking math um, at any time of day, right? This is available 24 hours a day. And it'll ask them questions until they satisfy or satisfactorily show their knowledge. Um, it can also be a debater, so you can ask it to debate a, a, a political topic with you. Um, several other on here, and there's much more out on the web. So in order to do these things, you're going to have to get an account if you haven't already. Um, there's some security recommendations. I would recommend 
just picking a throwaway Gmail account or some other, you know, some other host and don't tie it to your UARC account. Um, obviously, there's going to be some FERPA, HIPAA, copyright considerations as well for that content that you put in. So you want to do that. Um, we have been using it in developing our uh, some online classes. We've been integrating some of these assignment <coughs> ideas, but primarily what we've been doing is using it to assist in creating quizzes and uh, like reading assessments. So we'll take somebody's lecture with their permission. Um, it is transcribed through Kaltura. We'll take that transcription, plug it into an AI, and say create 10 questions of varying difficulty <coughs> and make sure that it requires um, process thinking, so it's not just uh, A, B, or C multiple choice. So those are some of the uses that we've been using. Am I You're good. You're taking a long time? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's really what I wanted to cover in a nutshell. I can take some questions. Great. Yeah, we like five minutes. Uh, questions for, for Ken about really a nice overview, I think, that he just set up for us for all the different ways in which, and some of the, the concerns that we and you can use it to generate some assignment prompts or assignment ideas as well. And that is what I did with the handouts. Well. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I've been working with developing courses in the new culture, uh, for global. And I'm curious in, about how AI is used within those Blackboard platforms. It seemed like in the discussion board there is an assessment of writing levels that is questionable. But I wondered if that is considered AI and how much of that is incorporated into the learning platforms. That could be considered AI, sure. Um, that's very similar to what Packback has been doing for several years. That's a, a video discussion. I don't know the details on how it is doing that. I do know that there are some tools that we're looking at turning on in Blackboard that is uh, generative AI. So you can ask it to generate a discussion board prompts on, on these topics, and it will generate out some ideas for you. It'll help generate objectives also. So they're looking at turning those on perhaps over Christmas. They may be checking with legal on that before they do. So this is something you can use. It's just there, and you can access it. If it you will be. It will be within the interface. Okay. Um, thank you for, so much for the uh, overview regarding the, what you actually do with the global campus. However, I am actually a bit stumped at a, uh, something that had been mentioned in the handouts here. I'm not sure if this is, ha has been done by you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, one of the key elements that has got me intrigued uh, due to my kind of work, because I am a candidate of PhD in comparative literature, is to uh, basically produce AI-generated poetry, short stories of persuasive narratives. This is underneath the AI-generated creative writing project. Analyze the unique critical qualities of AI generate generated creative content. Now, I'm kind of in the crossroads here because of the word unique. Uh, because earlier you had intended to add the idea of uh, Emily Dickinson and how everything that had been regurgitated by ChatGPT Ch for that matter had been basically a retelling of what she had already written. So how can it be unique and at the same time be something that had already been done before? In, in which one is that? Uh, this is in the uh, AI generated creative writing project. Yes. We have, say, ChatGPT generate some poetry for us. And knowing that it's pulling from existing material, right? But it's not pulling chunks. It, okay. It's a generative AI, so it's do, using a predictive model to predict what words should come next based on what it's already done. So it would be unique, even if you asked it to do the same thing again. You'll, it, it'll, if you ask it many, many times, it'll start looking very familiar. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Thank you.
And this cuts into the question of authorship, mm -hmm. of authenticity. Yeah. I, I think of the term like, you know, uniqueness, like it, is that, can it really be, can we use that term, unique? And, and, and this is at the center of the Hollywood strikes, right? Like, yeah. can you just pull from screenplays uh, that are existing and, you know, have like an Aaron Sorkin screenplay about film blank, right? And, um, so I think that's a good question, um, but it's also, important to remember, right, that we are going to get different answers every time. We don't actually know how the neural networks are actually processing uh, each of these commands and how they're adapting uh, to input. And so the input that we put in and monitoring that is obviously key to this. But that's a great question. There's another one over here. I think you might have answered it because my question was about the tutoring function and how you can guarantee the accuracy, but I guess because you are monitoring. Well, you know, there's no guarantee of accuracy. Yeah. That's why you, want, you do want to be careful. Okay. You can't let it sort of teach your students. Mm -hmm. well, it depends on the topic, right? There's, there's going to be some things that it's been trained on that it's going to give you some solid answers on. Yeah. Things you want to check. And the debater. But that, but you mentioned could, the debater, too. Yeah, the that can also be another process in the assignment for the student is to double check those answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Magnolia? Yes. I just um, wanted from a, a K-12 standpoint, uh, first off, I appreciate everything that you've shared, very um, wonderful information. When this AI is in the classrooms, period, there are going to be some teachers that are not going to jump on it quicker than others. Uh, could you speak to how students will be at a disadvantage when those teachers don't move quickly enough? And so you have those classrooms that are implementing it and those um, classrooms that are not. Can we speak to, you know, what that looks like? Sure. I mean, you can make comparisons with any other tools that have come along. Mm -hmm. uh, the classic ones, the calculus. Uh, then I would say the internet and search engines where students who had access to the internet were not only quicker, faster, better access to knowledge, but they were learning how to use that tool. And so learning how to use the tool is also a very important aspect. Learning how to write a good prompt to get that answer is, is another skill that students need that you're going to have to provide. Thanks, Ken. I think we should probably move to our next speaker, but let's thank uh, Ken for thank you. Thank you, James. Oh, we're going to... We need a couple more chairs. Yeah. <laughs> Quick break to uh, bring some more chairs. Yes. Uh, also, just for the sake of timing, I am timing on my watch. I will give a two minute, one minute, and done. Yeah, I've got my timing. Okay. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here we go. That's it? Yeah. have a copy of this handout, would you mind sharing it with maybe Curtis and Curtis so we could also I'll share, share all of these with Curtis later. Perfect. Okay. And we awesome. could we could maybe then share a link to all the materials we covered today. So you don't need to be um, scribbling down titles and whatnot. We'll just share a link so you can have access to all the materials we talked about, including Ken's really helpful handout. Great. Um, thank you, Trent. I strategically waited to introduce the team uh, so, you know, Folks would fill in. I, I knew that it was not a, a mistake, me forgetting to mention the team. Um, so let me do that now. <laughs> so I'll just introduce our, our researchers, the ones who design all the promotional material and have helped, you know, make this event known. That's Cheyenne Roy, our assistant director, and PhD candidate. Uh, uh, um, I'm so sorry. You gotta Larissa Roca. Larissa Roca. And <laughs> PhD candidate China Nellen and our FLTA, Elena Shestelopo. <laughs> sorry, but they're they're helping you sign in, get seats. Oh, and of course Mike Michael. <laughs> 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 
I'm the least important here. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> Mike also runs our, our VR in, in, in the classroom. So. Yeah. Um, also, another important note, lunch is arriving around 12.15, yeah, so uh, towards the end of the session when we probably just open up for a general Q&A for all panelists, uh, lunch will be arriving, you can grab that and you can hang out and just chat about the yeah, class in general. Okay, so we'll move now to our next speaker, Maggie Fernandez. Hello, um, can everybody hear me? I'm masked, so I'm just make sure. Um, I'm Maggie Fernandez. I'm a professor in English. Uh, my focuses are, I do digital rhetorics and writing, so I'm very interested in digital uh, writing technologies and algorithmic oppression specifically. Uh, and I'm very interested in like the pedagogy of that, so this has sort of been an exciting year for me. <laughs> and I will probably also, even though my work has like really centered on the ways that digital technologies are have always been part of the writing process, even before we've even really necessarily conceived of them as digital. Uh, I'm pro I might sound the most like a Luddite, <laughs> so bear with me. I promise that's not really what I am, but I might have been wrong. Um, in the sense that I am, uh, the things that I've, I've been talking with students about over the last year, I've really been focusing on algorithmic technologies and labor, which intersects with the ways that I think about writing as process and how that fits in with uh, the way that first year writing classes and the writing discipline focuses on writing, not just as a product, but as a process. And so in thinking about labor, I've been thinking of, I've been talking to my students about content moderation. We've been talking about, uh, about perspectives on AI and writing from the perspective of artists. We've been talking a lot about intellectual property, all of these things, data privacy. And uh, the image actually on the screen is created by Dali for uh, an article about striking uh, Kenyan co uh, content moderators who make these technologies work. And so one of the things that's really important to me in talking to my students is how these technologies are biased, they are not neutral, in the same ways that search engines aren't neutral, in the same ways that our learning management systems aren't ne neutral, and they're built on a lot of exploitation in the same ways that cell phones are built on a lot of exploitation. So these are a lot of the things that I've been talking about. And also in sharing like an, a Dali image, which is created at a very like fraught intersection of really cool technology and st potentially stolen artist labor, there's a lot of tension there that I'm talking about with my students and that I encourage folks to talk about because we're not getting away from it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to run head first into things that make us uncomfortable without sitting with those that discomfort. Um, so the class that I'm teaching this semester is first year writing, uh, a class that most students take on, on campus. The assignment sequence is pretty sh straightforward. We do a summary. I transformed that this semester into an infographic and a summary to ask my students to do a little bit of visual interpretation of a text, me thinking, Oh well, a chat, chat GPT can do a summary. How do I and I, how do I get them to maybe like stretch those like summari summarizing skills themselves? We then did a critical interface analysis where I asked students to think about their use of algorithmic technologies, like in like their personal experiences. Some of them wrote about their interactions with algorithmic technologies on Spotify. Some of them wrote about them with Grammarly. Some about some of them wrote about how uh, about various social medias. Nobody wrote about ChatGPT, and I can't figure out why, because I haven't banned ChatGPT. I teach them how to cite it, uh, and we did synthesis, and we're working on the reflection. But uh, what I've basically been leading my students through are through these through a a a, uh, a writing class that is in progress of thinking about these things, uh, guided by some recommendations by the uh, MLA and Siege Joint Task Force on Writing and AI Working Paper. So two organizations that are coming together to think about like, what do we care about when we're talking about writing instruction um, and at, the, at high school levels and at college level. And essentially, uh, it's, it's a lot of what we hear people say, it's, it's not going anywhere, but we don't necessarily have to abandon everything that we know in order to teach with it and to teach what we've been teaching. And it's reaffirmed that writing is process and product, and that we should care about the labor of writing. And so I'm tying these things together with my students that the labor 
is not individual. We're coming together at the intersection of a lot of technologies, the intersection of a lot of product. Generative AI can't be used by itself, and it can be used as a tool. And so in that way, I've been trying to take a kind of chill perspective toward it when it comes to uh, teaching it so far, because it has been only a year. Uh, and I'll kind of talk a little bit more about why that is. Um, but what I've been really like trying to focus on in my conversations with graduate students and fellow teachers is that this is something that we have to learn together with students. And so my, I want to foster exploration and creativity, as this task force has said. And I'm not really surveilling, disciplining, or punishing students, or even asking them too much to like disclose uh, beyond citation. Uh, I want them to cite, but I don't want them to feel like they have to explain themselves about why they're using it. So for me, my main concerns, and these are concerns I'm talking about with my students because their insights matter to me a lot. I want to talk about algorithmic oppression and research writing. As someone noted, it's not accurate, and it, because it's trained on a messy white supremacist internet, it's very racist, it's very sexist, and things like that are improving in some ways and getting worse in other ways because that's the nature of algorithmic technologies. And so we talk about that when I teach research. Uh, in, in, my, in my classes, you know, we return to the library. I also talk about that with Google Scholar, though. And like, that's part of what's important for me, is like, this is not new. We're not, doing, we're not dealing with new problems, we're dealing with new technologies. I also really talk to them a lot about linguistic justice. One of the reasons why I don't really engage in too much prompt engineering yet is that I am concerned with and I want my students to be aware of the way that ChatGPT flattens language. Or at, in, when you prompt it incorrectly, it engages in stereotype. And linguistic diversity is really important to me and, and the field that I belong to. Uh, students have a right to their own language. So I don't want to flatten language for my students necessarily by, by the project. Um, and then intellectual property and data privacy, those kind of comprise uh, a couple of things that I've been that we've been thinking about in class, where we talk about how this has been, how these technologies have been trained, where this labor is coming from, if if it's not unique, are there problems with the ways that the labor that these, this writing is coming to us? Are we are we interacting like in good faith with people's work? A lot of authors <laughs> don't seem to think that we are because their te this technology has been trained without their consent on their work. Mm. How does that make us? It's very interesting to teach this at the same time as the writing strike and seeing that unfold. It was really fun to talk about those things with my students um, who felt very like passionately about it in some ways and less passionately in others. And then the main thing that, I'm con that my field and me by extension are like, really concerned about is the way that this is like creating a lot of panic around plagiarism, authorship, and academic integrity. I really want my students to think of themselves as capable of doing important work. But we, we always want to complicate solo authorship, especially when you're, um, you know, the, when we know the importance of peer review, learning in community, drawing on references, and doing research. So I'm more worried about my students being harmed by panic about plagiarism than I am worried about plagiarism itself, which can sometimes sound a little bit crazy. But, uh, because it's only been a year, I haven't been prompt engineering yet. I haven't been teaching my students to prompt engineer. I hear concerns that we want students to get ahead of the curve. Uh, I also worry that there's, as a first year writing teacher this semester and another, I want them to get, I want them to at least try their hand at some of these skills that will make them better prompt engineers. The work of summary is an important skill, and I don't want to, <coughs> Ever, I also want to emphasize for them the importance of reading for yourself. Mm -hmm. So doing summary really does ask you to read for yourself. And if, if I'm teaching them about algorithmic oppression, someone else's reading of important texts is not necessarily going to give them the opportunity to do critical thinking. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of critical thinking that goes into prompt engineering. But for a first year student, I want them to maybe spend some time thinking for themselves and practicing those skills and developing those like muscles. <laughs> Uh, which is where, for me, this is maybe a matter of like audience. Who should be? Who we should we be asking to practice prompt engineering? More advanced students can do more with it. I think. Um, I'm also again. It, this comes down to like some concerns about linguistic diversity for me, uh, and also, as you were saying, the like equity issue of 
some students are going to have access to 3.5, some are going to have access to paid, uh, paid technologies. Mm -hmm. And although I don't grade grammar in my classes as part of like a disciplinary commitment, I don't really want to like set my students up to think, to like read into outputs what matters to me, because that those are often very misaligned. Um, I'm talking so I'll, I'll, I've shared these. I don't want to go over my time. I think I'm getting really close. So essentially, I think that we have time to think about these things. Uh, just because I'm not teaching prompt engineering to first years yet, I'm, I'm building my syllabus for the January intersession and we're going to play around with it with some juniors and seniors. Um, but what I'm really thinking about now is how the future of generative AI is embedded. And a lot of students, they're not that concerned about it in some ways because they've been exposed to things like Grammarly for years. They don't even think about that as AI, but it's doing a lot. And I think we'll see some different process-based, uh, we'll see some different writing processes when it is actually more end of an integrated thing than a copy-paste situation. So just thinking about processes where I, I'm at, and I, I'm, I'm a little less concerned about, and I have mixed feelings about embedded generative AI and like our Google Docs and our work, Microsoft Word. It's getting there and it's getting more and more, but I think I'll have, a, I think that taking my time and figuring out how I want to teach those things isn't a disadvantage, it's just preparing my students to have, be already aware of these conversations about bias and inequity before they start kind of developing their writing processes around these technologies. Okay, I'm so sorry, I've spoken so much. Uh, no. <laughs> no, that was really great, very helpful. We have five minutes now, uh, questions for uh, Maggie. We'll start from with Terry, and we'll go to China. Terry. Uh, so appreciate what, what you were talking about. Uh, I have a couple questions, but I guess I'll keep it brief. Can you? Uh, go a little bit more in detail about the language flattening and um, uh, understanding more about the, the justice of literature uh, and language um, based on what you were talking about. And then um, also can you go a little bit more in depth about, um, I guess, from a user perspective, um, I guess when we interpret, you know, what's split out of like a chat GPT, uh, it still has to, um, I guess, be given our flavor. You know, um, so I guess if you can kind of talk about those things. Yeah, so again, most of the problems that ChatGPT has aren't like they're not specific to ChatGPT, it's just kind of like layered problems. Mm -hmm. But uh, ChatGPT is linked to flattening language diversity because most of the internet is in English, mm -hmm. most of the internet is catered for, uh, you know, white mainstream English, especially. Uh, I mean, this is like a problem on like Wikipedia. It's a problem. Most of the internet isn't searchable for people who don't speak English in the same ways. So it's really an issue in that uh, it's going to spit out more. It's going to spit out English in certain ways. We also don't know how it's exactly set up. <laughs> so uh, it, that might be part of its like programming to be like what professional discourse is. Mm -hmm. The idea, like that's there's already like stereotypes baked into like what we identify as professional. So, if it, you ask it to tur turn out a cover letter, it's going to, which is good, not necessarily a bad thing in terms of it's kind of one of those complicated tensions in that it can be used to increase access uh, to white language, but it also promotes white language supremacy. So, it's what that's one of those issues um, where. Uh, it's, it's just linked to that, <laughs> and it really kind of reveals a lot of what we think about professional language, academic language, which is really interesting to talk about with students, but not necessarily like great for keeping flavor. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, your second question I may have forgotten. Well, that, that, was, that was it, like more vernacular, you know, I guess, or flavor, you know, because when we interpret this, yeah, it's, I guess that's that whole debate of what is technically stolen content. It's all out, you know. It's, it's, it's like tapping into the uh, the Akashic record. It's like, or oh, the great mind. It's like, how can you really take ownership of any of it? You know, these thoughts you didn't create it, it just came. Someone else can also have that, but your interpretation of it and how you regurgitate or re-deliver, mm -hmm. it has to come from a more authentic space. So I guess I was more so asking about, um, in your instruction, how do you uh, intend to guide, you know, I guess students on making sure it's their flavor? 
Yeah, so I would I want to teach them that it's a tool, not a like first stop. I also want to tell them that it's what is what it can be really good for um, is understanding genre conventions, which are also like normed culturally. But like if you're looking at like what are all the pieces of this type of writing that I need? It can get you that first draft, that outline in a really good way, which is a, it can help students who get like really like you know shy with the keyboard like from like starting or like getting that like writer's block, and then you can go back in and revise to like put your own <coughs> flavor on it. But what I am always worried about in my like experience as a writing teacher who doesn't teach grammar and like doesn't like grade grammar and wants students to be expressive. Those like norms and those like values are really baked in, and they don't trust me, and that's fine. <laughs> they don't need to trust me, because <laughs> like they've been graded on certain things their whole lives. So the ideas of like what's quality, what's the value of flavor, can really get mixed up, especially when the the tool that I'm telling them that they can use is churning out writing that all sounds kind of the same. I hope that answered that question. <laughs> Good, let's go back to China. Yes, I, I think part of my question might have been answered, so I'll make a statement, and if there's a question in there, maybe, okay? Uh, <laughs> but, um, I purpose by saying I teach Kung Fu and Antu, and I'm a GA for the English department, um, and I also be teaching Black people storytelling next semester. What I have found in my experience with uh, people I've interviewed, had conversations with, who use ChatGPT in particular, chat, especially ChatGPT3 can be trained, right? To when we're talking about that language, and vocabulary, things like that. I have, I have friends who spent hours with ChatGPT, and now they talk to them the way that they talk to ChatGPT, right? So, um, so it's really important that um, the BIPOC people of diverse backgrounds are in creation of these algorithms, which ChatGPT <coughs> and other um, forms use, so so that that it will collect different types of information. But we can also be a part of that without creating algorithms by participating in using ChatGPT, right? Um, and that's how we start to change those dynamics. The other thing I was going to say is, so for my classes, I also am very open to them using any type of AI, chat GPT, whatever you want to use. It's completely fine because you have to cite. Because you have class. to cite. And chat GPT, the one thing it does not do, and most AI things do not do, is they don't cite. They don't cite. So feel free to send me a whole page with no citations. I'm going to send it right back. <laughs> you know, I, where are your citations? And so to me, Think of ChatGPT as a lesser form of Wikipedia or Google or any of those other research engines. They give the student an idea and then they have to go figure out where those ideas come from. The same thing is if they write a paper and they have this brilliant idea, like, okay, I need a source to support that because you weren't the first person to think that. Right? So when I'm asking them to use ChatGPT tools, things of that nature, awesome, this is a great one. Where did the information come from? And it's still teaching them how to go and do all those things that we're afraid of, which is cite your sources, make sure that you're not plagiarizing, and all of that. But I agree. I think ChatGPT is an excellent sounding board, an excellent, you know what I'm saying, way to get started. And I think that the things that we are afraid of, we already have uh, roadblocks in place. That's you know where writing is process helps. Process. We already have a process in place to, to combat that. I think that those are false fears. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think so, too, which is why it, it makes me sad, because people are... The, which, the people who get called out for plagiarism are usually marginalized students. It's and it's. I think a lot of the plagiarism honestly that I've received at this semester in my class has been from Wikipedia, like not even mm -hmm. using ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. And because it's not a scary thing in my class, I really think that students are kind of being thoughtful about when they use it instead of go, turning to it in desperation. I know there are more questions, but yeah. we have to move to our next Thank speaker. So let's uh, let's thank Maggie for. Uh, All right. So switching over for Guillermo. Let's see. Can I move it from here? No, just okay. Okay. All right. So hi everyone, my name is Guillermo, I'm a PhD candidate in comparative literature. I uh, teach Spanish on campus and before moving to what I prefer today, I was listening to everyone and most of you mentioned that ChatGPT is a content generator. But few of you have mentioned ChatGPT as an assistant. I'm a TA, my salary is super low, <laughs> just for the records, so I'm using ChatGPT as my TA as my GA, so if you see it from that perspective, it's totally different. Yeah. Um, 
in the last couple of weeks, I saw a professor in, on the hallways and we were talking about ChatGPT and how students were asking ChatGPT and how maybe we should be careful of, on how they use it. So that conversation was a couple of weeks before and the version point, uh, 4.0 has GPT and you can train your own GPT. Mm. Let me give you an example. You are talking about comedies. So you have a, a huge database of 100 comedies. If you upload it and you create your own GPT, you can train your students to have a direct conversation with those 100 comedies. In that way, you are guiding your students to have a real context and communication with those 100 comedies. That's there, but people only focus on ChatGPT as a generator. Why not as an assistant? That's the only part that I really want to comment on that part, just to keep the conversation. So, the next slide. Uh, the way that I'm using ChatGPT, of course, as, a, as my assistant, is that I do not like the way the book, the one that we use on campus, offers vocabulary. So I have been thinking about, okay, how I can use ChatGPT or any other tool to generate more content that my students can learn it in a different way. So I just grab different kind of vocabulary, I create a list, and I say, hey, best friend, can you help me and create a story with these 20 words? I just want that you focus on this specific topic. The target audience is this one and I don't want that you expand more than 1,000 words. Mm. And then my best friend does it for me. As a TA, I save time and I invest more time on reading and writing my dissertation, which is the primary focus why I'm a TA on campus. I'm not getting paid by being an instructor, I'm getting paid to get my diploma. But I also want to offer a quality work, so I use ChatGPT to help me on that part. So with this part, it produced wonderful stories. Of course, there are mistakes. I changed, tailored, modified, and verified that everything is accurate. But from my perspective in this context, it's wonderful. Uh, the next one, uh, as a TA, I cannot design my, my exams. Exam one, two, three, final exams, we are not allowed to do that. So from my perspective, it's kind of, it's not fair. So then I have trained my students to use the prompts that I have designed. And I said, okay, this is the review exam that we have on Blackboard. You can use this prompt to mimic the same uh, prompt and structure of the exam that we have in Spanish. And then you can create your own exam. You can practice. They have generated multiple quizzes. The quizzes that I bring to class are a mimic of the one that we have on Blackboard. Of course, I change and I edit in order that they can have that information. And results have shown in my class that that helped them a little bit. Not too much because I do not have the time to do a survey, which will be amazing. Uh, but it has benefited the way that they uh, use grammar in class. Most of my students have two, three jobs. They take multiple classes. They do not have time to come for tutoring services, so why not use ChatGPT as a form of tutoring? In the case of grammar, it's useful because they can the, the prom, they know how to conjugate verbs in AR, IR, ER, stem changing. There is different kind of beautiful words for grammar. Even though that the verb could be wrong and invented, the structure that my students require for writing and taking an exam is perfect. So I use it to mimic and create different kind of sources that as my TA, uh, I do not have time to design my own quizzes. And I also want to provide this um, equity. So if I cannot do my own exam, at least my students can have a copy of what a possible exam, final exam can look like. Then uh, the last thing that I have been doing, uh, and this is not for the current class, but for, for one that I'm designing is that um, I want to produce a real content with uh, information like this on Netflix. So to design just one lesson plan, I need to watch one episode that is 45 minutes, uh, sometimes of course 45, 50. So if I watch the video and then design the questions for just one episode, I can spend like five times the amount of it. 
So after, of course, talking to my best friend, I realized that there is this, uh, I don't know if you have heard about the files that are SRT, that is the subtitles. Mm -hmm. So sort of what I do is I download the subtitles in Spanish, mm -hmm. then I have this conversation 10 minutes, like I want that you use this vocabulary, I'm teaching this particular topic, I just want that you help me to design one lesson plan that covers conjugation in simple tense with the first 10 minutes. Bah! Magic is there. And then I was kind of curious, like, wow, you can do that? Okay, let's go to the next level. I want that you give me 50 words, the most important 50 words in the first 10 minutes that are related to the European framework for teaching languages that address this specific level. But the information is there. So I think that the problem is not how we use chat GPT, but I think that aiming at the future generation is that we need to train them how to use them. And then in the last part is that today, well, the last week there were two articles. One, I put it right here, in the Chronicle of Higher Education and also in Inside Higher Education, one was in favor of ChatGPT and the other one was against ChatGPT. Uh, so a skill that I have learned in my program is that always you need to read the author, the context, mm -hmm. and the historical background of the people who wrote the article. And to my surprise, few of them have explored technology. The age in comparison to mine is different. So because I have been doing my dissertation in the moment that ChatGPT start as a consumer and as a producer, I think that ChatGPT covers every single aspect of the critical thinking skills that we want that our students have. In my case, I use it to solve problems to offer guidance and to expand their curiosity for learning Spanish as a second language. So I have more things to discuss, but on the aspect of Spanish, this is how I have been using in my class. And that's, in the case of movies, that's the one that I want to use in the future. Great, okay, well we have uh, five minutes. Questions <coughs> for Guillermo, I'm sure there are. Many. That was really interesting. Yeah, up here. Yeah. So, <clears throat> thank you so much for your very insightful um, kind of presentation. So, the first question is, uh, what's the name of your best friend or TA? Oh, ChatGPT. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ChatGPT is my best friend so far. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, it's amazing. What's we that? can have, and, and this is something that people have don't mention is that we talk about the ChatGPT is we're talking about a free version. So if you really want to expand, I, I'm paying the full version because I, I don't want that people tell me, ChatGPT does this, let me try it. ChatGPT has the option to upload 10 PDF files at the same time. So because I struggle a lot with Foucault, what I'm doing is that I upload 10 files of Foucault and I start having a conversation with him like, hey, this is my argument. I think about the weight of maps because I'm studying maps. This is how maps works. Do you, do you agree with me? And then, of course, ChatGPT is going to use the voice of Foucault and is going to hit me on my face. No, no, this is not the way. So I start having a conversation with someone that, of course, is not possible right now, but AI, as my best friend for dissertation, is helping me a lot on that part. OK, great. So following the, <clears throat> the previous comment or question, uh, so do you also cite your TA in your syllabus or when you give a lecture to a student? Good point. For the classes, my students don't need to write a paper. They're only using it for uh, learning the language and practicing the grammar. But for my work, I do not use it as a generator. Let me give you one example. Um, I write my paragraph. I know where my topic sentence is. I have supporting details. But I feel that something is, is not there. If I use the tutoring service on campus, the people that get hired, few of them are connected to PhD students or comparative literature. So sometimes I have brought my paper and I don't get really, really good feedback. So what I do with ChatGPT, I upload my, my paragraph and I use someone as an example. Let's think about Cortex. Let's suppose that he wrote a, an article and I said, okay, this is the structure that an academic on my field uses to write this particular paragraph. I am writing this paragraph. 
what I am missing. And ChatGPT can tell me, okay, Guillermo, based on Cortis' uh, uh, writing style, you are missing the hook. And as someone who is coming from Colombia, non-native speaker, I have never got any training, not even in my master here, PhD, on how to write a successful argument. So in my case, I have learned through my best friend how to write hooks and mimic and learn from other writers how to make a compelling argument. Mm. So in that way, I do not need to cite. That's what I think. We can have that discussion later. But ChatGPT, in my case, helps me to proofread my paragraph and give me feedback. Hey, this argument is weak. Mm. You need to offer more evidence. That's how I use it. They, ChatGPT, in my case, doesn't generate content. It only proves free and give me feedback on what I have written. Sometimes there was only one that I really got happy about that is like, Guillermo, the way you are using this, it's compelling. Good job. <laughs> I have never heard any of that, so I was like, oh, okay. If ChatGPT does this, it means that I'm on the good path. So that's why I do not cite it, because it doesn't generate anything for me. It's my TA. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the really, uh, I think, insightful question. Can we talk, go back to flattening language, though, and think about that in this context? You know, um, I. What did you think, Maggie, about the the example of using a particular article as like a sounding board for style, say, versus a generic, you know, dropping in a paragraph and having ChatGPT spit back whatever it spits back? I'm just curious on, on your take as a. I mean, I think that the way, I think what's interesting about that is that that is how we would, that's not an uncommon practice to do manually, I guess, to like have open a tab of an art, an academic article that you admire to like learn the genre as graduates. This is a strategy that I, I often like offer to graduate students, it's like find an article from, let's say your dissertation director, <laughs> that's probably might be what they think an article looks like if you could turn one into them. And then kind of comparing and like doing some rhetorical analysis to learn the genre. Because that's what I hear is like learning the genre as much as like maybe taking some style notes from it. Um, I, that doesn't sound that different to me ultimately, but I do wonder how that affects like the kind of style of it and what we think, how we can expand the genres that, we, that we're working with. I don't know. Yeah, for me, I was hearing process. Yeah. A big part of process, it, you know, the writing as a process is sitting across the table from your advisor or sitting across the table, you know, from someone you're, that, you know, is, is like in a mentor role and writing with them. Even if writing in that, converse, in that context is like a conversation, it's looking at, a, at something that you wrote and pouring over that with them. Um, but well, I have to balance that with what you're talking about, which is like you're teaching two classes, right? And you might not always have access to your advisor. So um, yeah, I mean it's I, I don't have I don't have a, a clear cut answer there, but I, I, I do wanna I just wanted to bring the terms you brought up earlier, flattening the flattening of language and, and also writing this process to this conversation because I think they probably add some helpful complexity to it. Ken? So regarding flattening of language <clears throat> just thinking about how it how it's trained on a large language model and we know where that came from. So it's predicting what the next word is likely going to be based on analytics of how often that word appears mm -hmm. in what context. And so that, I believe, is how the flattening occurs. Mm -hmm. But using it as, you know, if, if I wanted to have a chat with Socrates, I would upload everything Plato ever wrote about him. And then it, it, it shrinks that model that it's looking at. And so that's kind of a next level usage that could potentially get rid of that flattening. I think it's in, certainly in this situation. I think it's certainly a, a next level usage. China, do you see there was a question? Yeah, it comes down and the name I actually had a question related to China's oh, okay. comments. <laughs> yeah. that, um, to what degree can your conversations be accessed and be this article, right, so that more people are hearing and picking up the genre or the, the flavor of your friends that are teaching it to I recognize language in a different way, right? Instead of Socrates, we have your friends mm -hmm. as the model to study <laughs> and infiltrate this language, mess up the language, unflatten mm -hmm. the language. So that's my question. How accessible are your 
training are your friends carrying? Yeah, so uh, the, so the one person I'm talking about specifically is a community organizer, and she's literally been training that Chat GPT for two years. She's upgraded with Chat GPT as it's upgraded, and for and what's interesting is so I literally go to uh, in the conferences where we just talk about chat GPT in the classroom and like the issues and the, the scariness and all of that of it. And so what's interesting to me about this conversation with her is that she's not academic. She's a lady who's like in her 60s who just does community work and has used it, found it like YAML is a, is a very useful tool. And she's told me that if she talks to chat GPT in a certain way, it won't respond. It's almost like it gets emotional, like it shuts down. You know? <laughs> like, so she just has to learn how to speak nicely to it and, you know, and, and, and encourage it. And, you know what I'm saying? that she's been working with it for so long, it starts speaking back to her in the language that like that she speaks to in the slang and things of that nature. So um, I do, as the whole time Yerwin was thinking, similar to where Curtis just said, and I'm sorry, I forget your name, the other presenter, mm -hmm. I see it as without us having to, I still think that more BIPOC people should be creating algorithms, but I think it's a way around, you know what I'm saying, a shortcut until we get more people creating algorithms to kind of create some more. Yeah, I agree, and I think you're low with your, um, your, your studies with language, I know that's secondary, um, but how accessible then you make your material, what you're producing to other instructors, let's say. And I know this is an issue with teaching, I develop yeah. my own materials, if you're redo working, you're doing extra work to create, but maybe someone's already done this. And to what degree? I guess this is just showing my ignorance on the whole chat GPT and how much we know what other people are doing with it. Like, are we reinventing the wheel all the time? No, that, that, that's a wonderful question. Um, at the beginning of the semester, I shared an email with the rest of the TAs, like, hey, I'm doing this. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get any, a lot of follow up on that part, so in that case, I was just doing it by myself, and then how I share it with my students, I upload it on Blackboard. They already have the prompt for every single unit, let's suppose present, future, they know how to use it. Uh, but if you follow people on Twitter, on LinkedIn, there is like this, I, I wrote it here, Mushtaq Bilal, he's, he's one of the leader on academic writing. Right now he's doing, if I'm not mistaken, a postdoc at uh, Oslo University, not Norway or Sweden. I, I'm not good right now, that part. Terrible memory. Uh, but um, people are working a lot on different fields. In the case of Spanish, I have not found a lot of uh, this type of prompts. People are mentioning, I'm using this, I'm doing that. But then giving the feedback on the prompt, like this is what I'm going to do, people do not share it. And I think because they, Whoever creates the prompt is the one who, who has the money, who, who has the power. So then if, if you are accumulating this power, why you don't share it with your students? So I think that that's, that's the part. It's like teach them how to create prompts. It's going to give them the skills of power for, for the job market. Great. Guillermo, thank you so much for your time. Let's uh, thank you. I know there, there are more uh, questions uh, and talking points. I'm going to I'll go through my presentation quickly, and afterwards we can have a Q and A that either addresses my presentation or anything that preceded it. Um, I do want to, though, quickly um, kind of cite, reference, uh, in, invoke the perspective of Lu Zhang, who was at our first AI and Society panel discussion, and he actually uh, studies. He's a comp sci professor here. He studies bias in training models uh, for. Uh, of large language um, uh, models, and uh, his biggest concern with Chat GPT is that he doesn't, he can't look under the hood, right? And so, I, that's just part of this conversation on that really deep level, like you know, actually getting involved in, and looking at out, at algorithms. That's the work that that Lu Zhang and, and Carter Buckner, our our, our good friend and comp side, that's what they're interested in. So I think there's a conversation on the kind of day-to-day -day level of interaction, and then there's like the really good work that's happening at this university and I think across the country, folks trying to open up ChatGPT and actually understand what is happening there um, so that we have a better uh, you know, overview of, and then we can then better intervene to stop uh, bias there. Um, okay, so I'll just quickly, as quickly as I can, cover uh, the way that I've been incorporating AI and, and looking at AI in the course that I'm currently teaching right now uh, called Intro to Digital Humanities, poster designed by Larissa Roca, uh, one of our researchers uh, here. Um, I have a four-week learning module, I ran a four-week learning module 
um, about AI, but we kind of focused on ChatGPT. As is always the case in my DH courses, we're mixing theory and uh, praxis, theory being readings, of course, in class discussion, and then lectures, or, or in our case, this semester, we had some lovely guest lectures. We have some more on the way. Uh, and then uh, praxis, uh, typically in the form of various uh, types of assignments, most often a, a, a blackboard discussion post that's happening on a weekly basis. And then in class activities, both group and individual. Again, sorry, I'm going to go as quickly as I can here. So just if you are interested in any of these texts, know that you'll be getting an email with a link to a share folder. They'll all be there. Um, we started off kind of just from a broad overview perspective, looking at mostly newspaper like journalism about AI. Down here we have a story about those uh, uh, Kenyan tech firms that were being used uh, to farm out the work of cleaning up ChatGPT. So I, th I thought that was a nice overlap, the image that you use. And then this was the class here. You see the unit here is AI and society. I'm introing the, comp uh, the topic, but I'm trying to gauge interest in the class. And everyone was interested in this. So then I knew that bias was something that we were going to be talking about. Um, so right up front, I could kind of start tailoring the, the module to fit the interest and the, and the needs of the class. Because for me, bringing AI into the classroom was an exploratory thing. You know, I didn't have some like overarching like goal there necessarily. Like let's just explore this and get into it uh, from the perspective of the humanities and hopefully drawing from uh, world cultural texts as as we did. So the the blackboard discussion post that week was just to have them reflect on the reading and again all signs pointed that we needed to be looking more at bias and the, the kind of human impact and human toll of uh, ChatGPT. We had then some in-class activities kind of introducing Dolly and ChatGPT to the students so they were comfortable using them if they wanted to, going to your concerns which I think are really well founded. I always gave an option out like to, you know, if you didn't want to use ChatGPT you could just reflect on the reading. So um, I'll be focusing on the Blackboard discussion assignments and posts that engage with ChatGPT but there was an, alternate if folks wanted to take it. Oh no, I'm running out of batteries. Um, <laughs> hold on. Okay. Week two. Theory. Foundation. So AI and art was, was the focus, but really I just wanted to lay kind of a groundwork. Um, we had a really helpful interdisciplinary article about art and the science of generative AI, a deeper dive. We've been kind of referencing this through the whole semester. We looked at Cal Newport's piece in The Atlantic. He's a technologist who's, you know, one of those folks who kind of hesitates and I think brings a, a, a critical um, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, hesitation before jumping into the chat GPT hype. Uh, he's also drawing on Alan Turing and just kind of giving a nice historical valence to the conversation that seems like, you know, everything is unprecedented, everything is happening right now. No, there's actually kind of a long tail leading to this point uh, where we are. And then we, I introduced Moloch and Moloch assigning AI seven approaches for students with prompts. So now we're going deep into prompting, but always with this critical reflection. And that's happening um, with activities like this one. China, could you grab my, the, Wait a minute. it's uh, on my desk. The presentation's pulled up on the actual computer. Too. Oh, okay. Yeah. On the new line that is. Thank you. Um, the practice for that week, because this first piece by Epstein is having us rethink creativity mm -hmm. uh, through AI, and so that's what I had our students do. Um, imagine a scenario where they usually rely on their creativity and now kind of reapproach that scenario with ChatGPT as a tool. And so we had some sample prompts here. Um, this is a, a this is a fun one about uh, cooking a steak for a customer. It had to be it was a filet mignon, medium plus no pink. But how how, how is that actually possible? Um, and this is a really fun discussion because then thank you thank you China. Then we found out that one of the students in the class is a grill master at a local oh, okay. high-end restaurant. And so we were having a conversation about like the human touch in like grilling meat, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that intersection with ChatGPT. So that was a lot of fun. Um, here we have a very specific uh, um, prompt from someone who is actually one of our FLTAs. Uh, and she's working with the Russian program. And so she's, this is like the first prompt, I think, in a series of prompts that are building towards a final project about um, how we can use ChatGPT in a language learning scenario. Uh, and then you see one here, give me directions in a prompt for painting an orange using uh, watercolors. I just want to, I brought in these samples because you're going to see how these prompts look at the start of the semester and then how they look 
you know, three, four weeks later when we've been prompting and kind of developing our prompting uh, strategies over time. Now, what <coughs> happens in this course is, or what inevitably happens in this course is that students take kind of a, a, a simple prompt from me and do cool stuff with it. So this student then took the response from ChatGPT to this prompt and dropped it into Dolly and then got these images mm -hmm. from Dolly and he was pointing to actually the flattening effect that you were talking about, Maggie. Mm -hmm. Like the flattening of the concepts that ChatGPT spit back to him and then the flattening of like kind of the images that he was given back through Dolly is like all kind of like the same look of an orange. And this is an orange, so kind of a neutral uh, object. And you can imagine if we brought in like identity into this scenario, it would probably be pretty um, exciting um, and disturbing. AI demo, this is a, a great week. The, what happened here was like we learned kind of how AI works and we then dove into bias because that was clearly something students wanted to talk about. Um, we had like, how does it work? We looked at a jargon-free explanation of how AI large uh, language models work. Um, actually a really helpful piece that set us up for our guest lectures from Carter Buckner, a PhD in uh, computer science, and he just got into bias and error and machine learning and helped us see the broader continuum of, of AI and machine learning, which I think was really important. Then we went kind of at, ended with a philosophical note, thinking about uh, the potential harm of AI. We dove deeper into Moloch and Moloch, working more with prompting, um, and we explored a more specific AI platform called Climate Q&A, which focuses on, of course, climate change. Right? If chat GPT is the answer to everything, Climate Q&A focuses on the climate crisis, and it cites all of its sources. So it does uh, some things very well, but it does so in this kind of specific space. We get, you know, I'm already pushing my students to think about you know, the importance of specificity, you know, I think as Guillermo kind of demonstrated so well. Um, then I had them rework uh, one of their past prompts, now using some of the strategies they picked up from assigning AI. I don't have samples for that because I just want to jump to the next one, which is a transition. Now we're kind of moving out of our AI unit into a unit where we're doing a close reading of Walter Benjamin's seminal essay, um, The Work of Art in the Age of Its Technological Reproducibility. That's an essay that's going to help us understand some of the questions we've been asking already about authenticity and authorship and creativity. Like Benjamin is looking at that from the perspective of the photograph and then the film camera after that and how things could be easily reproduced. Um, and so, again, not necessarily like giving students answers about AI, but you know, giving them some historical and I think philosophical and um, uh, artistic, aesthetic perspective on, on this very pressing and uh, kind of contemporary moment. I also had them read the first chapter of the uh, Cambridge Companion to Walter Benjamin, and then I had them uh, write a, a discussion post where after reading that chapter, they dig into a certain part of Benjamin's life and have a conversation with ChatGPT, or use ChatGPT. I didn't ask them to have a conversation, I said just use ChatGPT to learn more about something in Walter Benjamin's life that you found interesting. And then this now, we're going to look at some sample prompts that you can see where before they were kind of short um, and kind of to the point, now they've kind of changed in, in their perspective. So you say, you, right, referring to ChatGPT, you are one of the intellectual friends of Walter Benjamin who is being interviewed about his academic life and the problems he faced while trying to find a faculty member willing to take on his dissertation project. Please expand on how this affected his future work. Right? He couldn't find a Dr. Fata, a uh, advisor, to read his dissertation because it was just so, like, you know, insane um, and just groundbreaking. And so, regardless of what ChatGPT pumped out, and it was actually quite interesting, like the prompt here shows that the student is thinking about this, you know, companion to this Cambridge companion to Walter Benjamin in his bio, his bi biography. They're thinking about it, this really like embedded kind of creative simu like simulation where they're jumping in and they're like talking to Benjamin like already I think we've, we've had a success in just having them engage with this biography in a way that is I think more engaging than read this chapter and we'll talk about it on Tuesday right like they're already thinking about this moment and like what that moment actually means for the rest of the Benjamin's life we see more of that here and even more specific you are a neo-Kantian philosopher right at Benjamin's University it's 1912, right? So you have very specific prompts kind of going forward. And then here's one just from a, a, a pedagogical perspective. This is a 
student writing about how they might use ChatGPT to teach their students about Vault of Benjamin. And here's a 140 word prompt on how to uh, have students uh, ask questions about and, and, and um, continue to ask questions about Benjamin, right? You know, wait for a response, right? You see here at the end, wait for a response, answer questions. And so this is not a one and done sort of uh, interaction. This is meant to be um, a, a, a mentoring tool for students. And then always, as I should, I should have emphasized this on an earlier slide, but always I'm having students reflect, you know, um, include a snippet of ChatGPT's response and then a 150 word reflection on the process. I'm not in your position where like we're teaching writing skills. I have the liberty of saying like we're going to reflect on this. You know, this isn't this isn't necessarily how you should be writing. We, we're thinking about the process of working with ChatGPT. So that critical hesitation you were talking about, really appreciate that uh, from my perspective, and I'm kind of trying to bring that into the reflection piece here. And then well, these prompts indicate summary skills. You right. Can't, you exactly. Can't write these prompts without summarizing. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, and then here are just some sample final projects. Uh, you know, unsurprisingly, they almost all have to do with with AI, um, but we have AI in the courtroom, we have a student who's looking at the paralegal profession and, and wanting to, to, to uh, dig into that. We have uh, depictions of AI in contemporary media. Really exciting one here, building a lesson plan for comp one and two using ChatGPT for things like building confidence, editing, and free writing. So again, not, not replacing skills, but using ChatGPT as, as a tool. So you have a, a student from English, really a, a PhD candidate, thinking critically there. Uh, pen pal for ChatGPT is pen pal for language learning. Again, that's that same Russian student who's building these prompts over time and then they kind of post to the final project. Data analysis project powered by AI tool Elicit. That's actually uh, Larissa working with, it. again, another AI tool that's doing a specific task and we're finding that as more effective than, say, that one stop shop of ChatGPT, right? When you find a tool like Melissa that does a very specific thing. It's actually, I think we found in class, more effective and less problematic than what's happening in ChatGPT where we can't even look inside the box and figure out what's happening. Um, yeah, so just some uh, sample uh, projects there. I'll, I'll, I'll cut, I'll stop there and, and we can do maybe a Q&A now about my presentation or any of the talks before this and we have another 15 minutes or so, food should be arriving soon. So if you have questions for me or for any of our panelists, um, we have a few minutes for that. I'll just <clears throat> Thank you. 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 Th
cutting its writer's room, you know, in, in half uh, to, to then replace it with, with, with AI. Like, that's where I, I think, you know, being, being really strict about how we're, t how, how we're citing or, or using AI is, is key. And that was obviously at the center of the, of the strikes, and I think there's a, a decent resolution found there. But um, that's where I would focus that, that energy on bigger corporations that have more resources. Yeah, and even in like the written arts, to go back to what China was saying, like asking students to like asking people to cite, even that brainstorming part of the process, even if you know none of the words that ChatGPT generated end up on the page, letting people know that it's part of the process, I think, is pretty important, um, especially because that kind of goes back to like the writing rooms and the you know, it, where did this like idea come from? Um, it'll be interesting to see how if we can except that it's not that different from a lot of things we've seen before, which I think is kind of important to this moment, is a lot of what we're seeing is not super different, even if it's way more efficient. If we can like, destigmatize it enough that we can have transparent conversations about it, I think that will be helpful. Can we just pause for just a second? The battery's about to die. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about um, how people did it in the past, if, if I'm not mistaken, there were people before ChatGPT that they offered uh, proofreading services. People that had access to it, they paid for it. But if I'm not mistaken, they never mentioned, I pay for a proofreading service to this person. Uh, thank you for the, I don't know, $1,000 that I spent on it. Uh, you made my day. Uh, I got my PhD. So the people cited? Mm, no. Uh, There's a difference between brainstorming and no, but editing it, work. Yeah, but then I was just reflecting based on that because I never thought about that part. So it, it, it's it's interesting how we can create this conversation. Also, like <clears throat> I, I am aware because of maps that people pay other scholars mm -hmm. to design the maps. But yes, but then when, when they when they do that part, they do not mention that part. So I, I'm thinking about like, okay, great, we're using ChatGPT, we're open these spaces for, for sharing how we are doing it. Mm. But then on a piece of paper, if you say, I use this for proving my argument, how how valid my argument is going to be outside? Oh, <clears throat> this idea is wonderful, but 50% is yours and 50% mm. is yours. So then, as a, as a, as a Hispanic, non-minority student, uh, how people outside in academia are going to look at me. Oh, you use ChatGPT, maybe this wonderful dissertation is not as good as it's supposed to be because you use ChatGPT. Mm. So how we ban students, how we ban uh, <coughs> articles, how we ban books, because if we're doing it now, what happened in the past? Yeah. So I think that it's important to, to see. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm just, as a graduate student, I'm just sharing this. I don't have the answer. I'm just like comparing past, present, and future. Yeah. I mean, it makes me think about the way that we can be very precious about originality in ways that are kind of divorced from reality. <laughs> like, I'm people who know me know that I'm no fan of Save the Sign or Turn It In because those numbers don't really mean a whole lot. They don't tell you a whole lot about what a student's process was, and people can be misinformed about what those percentages mean. So, especially when you're thinking about well, if you're quoting or if you were. There's, you know, there's only so many ways to summarize a movie. Like if you're assigned something, if you're assigning an assignment that asks someone to do some summary, there's going to be some some things that have some repetition. Yeah. So I think what you're saying like kind of point, points to some ways that this is this is really messy and how some people are going to be judged more harshly than others based on the resources they have access to. This is why I love bringing Benjamin into the conversation because, he, yeah. as you can tell from the title of the essay with reproducibility in, in the title, he's concerned with the kind of cultural impact and uh, of of technology. Film is not in the title. Mm -hmm. you know, like the, the like the film camera, the camera or photography is not in the title of the essay. It's it's reproducibility and what reprodu reproducibility is going to do to cultural norms around our understanding of aesthetics. Right? Uh, notions like originality, um, notions like you know uh, creativity and like mastery, right? And that we can now just like take a picture and like you know painting is now erased. And obviously that's not what happened. But he's getting us ready for and prepping for and trying to, to help us keep an open mind for how all these terms are now going to take on kind of a different meaning post this technological advent. Um, so. Um, 
for me, I, I, I love bringing that essay. I, I think it's it's kind of evergreen in the way that we there there is a, a, a moment of controversy around a big technological development. Every time it happens, we have the same sort of, well, is AI art or can it be art? Yeah. Right. In the same way, like, can digital film actually, you know, is that the same? Is that really film? Can we call it art? Um, and so it's good to have uh, his perspective there. There are so many questions. I want to go. I want to go to some. Yes. I, I want to go to this. Well, I want to go to someone who hasn't who hasn't oh, got, got to ask one yet, and then we'll go up to Terry. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. In the best. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that, like, one thing that I think is very important in that Maggie brought on a little bit is the relationship, of, like, creative industry and labor. Like, I think one of the things that we have to really be thinking about. I like the the uh, assistant approach, but something that's happening here is that there are like. There's an owning class with a lot of power, and their, a lot of their relationship to like the creative industry is wanting to be able to essentially uh, generate endlessly without that like procedural relationship. Mm -hmm. and I don't know. I'm just thinking a lot about that relationship to like capital and owning and how creativity. Like, it would be great if we can all like have assistance and everyone is like much more emboldened in their creative pursuits and processes. But there is also this thing to be very concerned about, which is like who owns ChatGPT and who is using it and how can they use it. And That's a wonderful question. <laughs> no, and I think that um, if 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 I had a power, uh, not 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 as a graduate student, um, but as faculty, I think that offering a space that students can have access to premium accounts and that they can use those four computers and, and and be curious and and test do this, make errors. I think that that's part of of the process, but I totally understand where you're showing uh, and, and mentioning about the other side, the dark side of chart TPT that is also there. So I think that it can go to different directions. Yeah. I think it's a key point, and I know there are a couple more questions, so we're going to go through those, and maybe we can just keep that kind of top of the mind as, as we go forward. So Terius, we'll go Terius, and then Maria, okay? Okay, uh, so I can brief, but uh, it goes back to kind of what was spoken on just now, is when you use these tools, is that now classified as co-authorship, reference, or acknowledgement, right? So it, I think it depends on how it's used, but how, who, who dictates that? Then the second point I want to say is, you know, in using this tool in like just academia, I think you can clearly acknowledge why there's a fear because it's like, well, hell, it's changing the whole process of what we structure. It's, it challenges everything because now I can view it as a TA. And there's no need for me to have this human body employment. You know, I can use this as uh, empowerment for a, uh, a faculty to say, hey, this is the tool that you use. I expect, you know, this level of uh, production. You know, it changes the whole game by using this as what is now the norm. So I just wanted to kind of offer that and just get some insight. I mean, I think it's worth being concerned about, um, which is why I think I always want to emphasize that it can be a tool and also if people don't want to engage the tool I think it's okay because we are valuable beyond those things but ChatGPT emerged pretty early on in conversations about at West Virginia University like pretty early on <laughs> not to be like that will replace us because yeah. I don't really think that that's ever going to be the case but it will replace some of us if we can't think about what we want how we want to present ourselves and like an assistant assistant model doesn't replace us but sometimes I'm a little bit skeptical that the people making those decisions like care about our reasoning <laughs> um, so if they see like oh we can be more efficient so I think acknowledging things is useful and also recognizing like who probably can't get away with acknowledging things because some people are going to be held to a higher standard of solo authorship whether that's ever been true or not um, but I think acknowledgement is, is also helpful to say like this is something that we're all that many people are doing, <laughs> even if some people aren't. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I may have just gone. Sorry, WVU weighs heavy on my mind sometimes, so I may have just gone there for no reason. But. Let's go to Maria next. So we can um, sure thank you all. This was fantastic. Um, Guillermo <laughs> is <laughs> responsible for. It. Uh, my playing with ChatGPT, and I have to um, confess I only have access to the free version, so one of, I have two questions. One of them is, 
is the paid for version really worth it? The second is more of a concern uh, in terms of, well, we know students will use chat GPT is kind of inevitable. Uh, they're perhaps more curious and, and um, less afraid of what happens to the information, how it's processed on the other end. Uh, and when they do, um, I've just fed some things into ChatGPT, things that I really know. Uh, and the answer I got back was really disappointing. Yeah. And I'm thinking from a perspective of the student who doesn't know much about the topic and is going to ChatGPT asking it, what are the main three <coughs> plays in French theater in 19th century? Well, ChatGPT gave me a play by Moliere it was a 17th century playwright. And I pointed out, I pointed out to it, well, I'm really sorry, but Moliere isn't a, uh, a 19th century playwright. And it found a way to weave it back in and say, yeah, I know he's not, but he's really representative of French literature. Well, a student may not know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And may write that in their paper and turn it into me, and I'm going to wonder, well, where did you get that information? Yeah. So I, I, I have some concerns about that, and I'm curious to hear what you think about that. I, th those are well-founded concerns. I think Ken understands those, those concerns and, and the concept of hallucination. We've, uh, we've actually uh, confabulations and hallucinations. Um, again, we're kind of anthropomorphizing this thing um, whenever we use those terms, but uh, those are, that's kind of the jargon now. Um, I just want to say that the readings that I showed here like are directly engaged with that especially this assigning ai seven approaches like that is built into how students are prompting and like understanding expectations of what they what is going to be kicked back we've been prompting all semester uh in intro to dh with 13 in the class and i think you know roundly students are are disappointed uh in what they're getting back from chat gpt and very cautious and and um, critical um, so that's been the, and I've many, most of graduate students in the course and, and very critical thinking undergrads who I think are on the same page. Um, only when you get really specific, you feed in text, you feed in a PDF, you, you focus, you focus, focus, focus the prompt into a, a certain uh, specific realm, do I think that then we have the, the opportunity of, of getting back a, a, a helpful, a productive um, result or one that we can maybe like trust or more readily trust. Um, I think the, the what is spit back is always going to be productive because we learn more about you know the machine every time we use it. But um, yeah, that hesitation is and that concern is absolutely well founded. Uh, I also think that I just wanted to mention that I think that situation is going to be temporary. We're only a year in to a free version publicly available. And even prompt engineering is probably going to become less important in the years down the road. Um, and it's, it will give you exactly what you're looking for. Give it a few years. And so that's kind of the world that we're, we should start planning for now. Is the 4.0 better at that? I can speak about that part. Uh, for the three kind, by the three version, the 3.0, um, because I'm producing and I'm doing my, my dissertation, I, I failed the limits. I was aware that it was not worthy. So after watching videos on YouTube and seeing what people were doing with the 4.0, I realized that few people in, in literature, compared to literature, were using it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I did the, how you say, like, peace, uh, leap of faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I said, okay, let's see what you offer. So then it can read. It can uh, listen, you can also put audios, and it does uh, uh, different kind of things. But the one that might be interested to you is creating personalized GP, GPT. Like people, of course, if you ask a general question for chat GPT, it's gonna give you a general answer because most of the people in STEM, they are the one that feed chat GPT. People in humanities, few of us, they are using it. So then by creating a custom <laughs> GPT for your class, when I saw this person doing one on Plato, the first person I thought was about you because of the comedy, the Voyan and everything. So I think it will be worth it to try and see how your students can have a conversation with every single comedy that you have. So I think that you need to see ChatGPT as uh, based on your needs. 
you have your own problems, own issues in class. There was one that I I really struggled to organize students in groups because I might have a bias or I knew that they were good, they were not pretty good, so I tried to combine them. So just to be fair, I asked ChatGPT, okay, this is the list of my students. I only used a first name and no last name to avoid the FERPA and all these kind of things. Uh, so I said, okay, organize this list by alphabetical order using the last two letters. So it gave, gave me five groups that I didn't choose and I felt better by organizing my class in a, in a fair way. So you might have different problems during your teaching, researching, and di doing different kind of things. So I, I think that you should try at least ChatGPT to, to see how it solved that particular problem and how it helped you in the process. So I think it's, it's worth it. I would also say that um, in teaching like algorithmic literacies, what people are, are emphasizing is that it's not just about like teaching how to use it, but also when. Okay. And sometimes it's not a good fit for the, tr the tool doesn't fit the problem. Um, and like, you know, Google's, Google search is actually getting worse now. So I'm actually skeptical that like these things are always like teleologically like improving. I think that it's sort of dependent on, you know, specific user literacy specific like actual like area that we're talking about there may not be like an improvement in your area of research if there's not more like training for it to like access so but i often teach my students that like if they're going to use it which i don't teach them prompt engineering i try to teach them like use study so like if you're trying to write a cover letter for a job it's good at doing that and then you can go back and like you know edit it and make sure it's specific because you know your probably prospective employers aren't going to be that interested in like a bunch of wrong information about their company but it can teach you a genre it may not be great at like teaching you facts which is where we can teach things we know like library research skills or teaching chat gpt in conjunction with library research skills like i think that we don't have to throw out everything and assume that we can perfectly teach within one interface that wasn't designed for necessarily all of the skills that we're asking students to learn and the, the tasks we're asking them to do. Sometimes the answer is ChatGPT won't be able to do this for you right. without like way more effort on your part. It might just be easier to go to one search. <laughs> I really appreciate the message about specificity of the medium, of the tool, and of your specific objectives. And we, we, I think that's a critical element to this conversation. The food is here, and we're a little over time. So I think we should close there. I want to thank our panelists again for showing up today. Everyone for taking the time to, to be here. Thank you.